Hello and welcome! My name is Franz Kastrofunsch and you're watching Factor Film. Today we're going to be looking at Passengers, a fantastic film about a man who gets stranded in space and has to figure out how to survive and not go insane for the rest of his life stranded on a spaceship. As you probably know, because you probably watched the movie, he ends up waking somebody else up and deeming her to a life of solitude as well. Not the greatest guy. But, nevertheless, a fantastic film to watch. I thought as a movie it was actually pretty good. And you know, it was a, an original fresh script, which doesn't happen all that often in Hollywood anymore. Especially now with all the reboots and remakes and sequels and prequels and sequel prequels and whatever Alien's doing right now. It's really nice having a fresh face on the block, so to speak. Not the best movie in the world, but a pretty good movie. The science, on the other hand, is mediocre at best. Anyways, without further ado, here is Passengers. The Starship Avalon, pride of the Homestead Company, a massive 1,000 meter long vessel inspired by sycamore pods falling in the breeze, the hull's iconic shape carefully engineered to produce artificial gravity. The Avalon is capable of 0.5c, with its large constant thrust ion engines. It is a true testament to human engineering. The Avalon has a crew of 258 souls and carries 5,000 passengers. Equipped with all the amenities that you could possibly dream of, all catered to your personal entertainment. For the last four months of your voyage, indulge and let the Avalon help you recover from hibernation in a comfortable and friendly environment. That's what the folks at Homestead Company will have you believe anyway. I'm still trying to decide on their true intentions. Is the Homestead Company an innocent corporation just trying to make their way through the universe? I highly doubt it. Much more likely, it's some kind of Wayland Industries type corporation with questionable morals at best. At any rate, assuming you trust this interstellar corporation, let's analyze their big fancy ship, the Avalon, and decide whether or not you should buy that ticket to a new home in the first place. Let's start with that gravity ring feature. The basic design is three hull sections for the passengers to sleep in, store stuff in, and live in. Homestead refers to them as Habitat 1, 2, and 3. They revolve around a core sporting more storage, engines, and mechanical. Large ion engines at the back and a crew ring substantially smaller in diameter than the habitats in the front. All of it is protected by a double feature forest field to shrug off any space junk it might run into and collect interstellar medium hydrogen to burn in the ship's eight state-of-the-art fusion reactors. So far, it sounds pretty good. Nothing crazy, pretty standard stuff, it covers the basics. But how well do those gravity rings work to actually make you feel grounded? Most of us looking to buy interstellar tickets have a pretty good understanding of how gravity rings work. And to those of us who don't, here's a link to a guy who can explain it much better than I can. Okay, now that you're caught up with the rest of us, according to him, you need to strike a balance in between the ring being big enough that you don't feel any negative effects of the ring spinning extremely rapidly, but at the same time, that it's not too big that the ring rips itself to shreds. Apparently, Babylon 5 manages to find that balance at a radius of 500 meters. And it just so happens, quite coincidentally, that the Avalon also has a radius of approximately 500 meters. At this size, you should be able to enjoy the comfort of 1G while keeping the rotation effects of 1.3 RPM to a minimum. So, this seems to mean the gravity ring checks out for the Avalon, right? Well, almost. The Avalon has a second gravity ring in which the crew hangs out, and that one, for whatever reason, is much smaller than the habitat's ring, about a third the radius. And from what I was able to tell by looking over the homestead footage, the command ring is either rotating in the same direction as the larger ring at the same rate, or in the opposite direction at an unknown rate. I was a little confused about this, but either way, there would be some issues. If it's going the same direction as the larger ring at the same arc rate, well then, the apparent gravity on the command ring will only be a third of that on the rest of the ship. Which fine, isn't a big deal, but it's not what the Homestead Company shows in their advertisement. 
Okay, so what about the command ring going in the opposite direction? Well, since I don't know the arc rate, I can only assume that it corresponds to the gravity in the Homestead Company advertising, which looks to be around 9.81 meters per second squared, or 1g. But the only way to achieve that gravity on a ring that small is to increase the arc rate, putting it at 2.32 RPM. At this rate, you'd probably feel pretty woozy and gross if you made any sudden movements, and you'd likely trip and fall if you tried running. But hey, you're a passenger, why do you care? You don't need to go to the command ring. And besides, the Homestead Company might cheap out on its crew, but you're not gonna notice that way up in first class, are you? Turns out you'll probably have some pretty decent artificial gravity for your trip. But what about the propulsion system? The Avalon uses a huge ion drive at the tail of the ship, powered by eight fusion reactors. Ion engines do seem to be all the rage nowadays. So let's think about whether or not those engines could get the Avalon up to its cruising speed of 0.5c within 30 years of launch. The designers of the Avalon have stated that it has eight fusion reactors powering a salvo of ion engines. As there is no onboard propellant, the Avalon is using a magnetic field scoop at the front of the craft to collect diffuse hydrogen from space. Let's compare this to a tried and tested spacecraft, Dawn. Dawn uses an ion engine expelling onboard xenon propellant powered by solar arrays. If we look at how fast Dawn can accelerate and the percentage of its mass devoted to propulsion, we can very roughly extrapolate that to the Avalon. Because the Avalon does not have to carry any onboard propellant, we will remove that from Dawn's mass. That leaves Dawn with 25.6% of its mass devoted to propelling it forward. That is the mass of the engines and the solar arrays. As we don't yet have any numbers in the Avalon, visually, I judge the portions of the ship devoted to propelling the ship forward to be about 30% of its mass. Okay, so 25.6% for Dawn and 30% for the Avalon. With Dawn's acceleration of 7.4 times 10 to the negative five meters per second squared, it would take 64,232 years for Dawn to achieve 0.5 the speed of light. And that's not even taking into account the relativistic increases in mass as you approach the speed of light, which you would start to notice at around 0.5 C. So, not looking good. Even if we consider the 5% higher power to weight ratio for Avalon compared to Dawn, and if we allow for some advancements in ion drive tech since the time of the Dawn mission, I just can't see the number of 64,000 years getting down below 30 years like the Homestead Company claims. The Avalon will simply have no way of getting up to 0.5c in any reasonable amount of time. Looks like some false advertising going on here. And by the way, doing gravity assist on a nearby planet wouldn't make a substantial difference. And gravity assists don't really work on stars. So considering the gravity of the Avalon and the acceleration of the Avalon, maybe don't go buy your ticket just yet. Unless of course you're okay with being in stasis for way longer than advertised. Uh, Julie said 271. Uh, what are you doing? You're not actually going into an asteroid field. Star Wars asteroids. So many movies always show asteroid fields as dense regions of rock chunks and dust crashing into each other, making an impenetrable obstacle for any spacecraft that's trying to pass. Now granted, this looks really cool and makes for some awesome dogfighting scenes, it's just simply false. Back in the 60s, when NASA was getting ready to launch its Pioneer probes, they were actually worried that Pioneer might run into some debris in the asteroid belt because they were unsure of its density and how much dust there was and what kind of micro asteroids they might hit. Pioneer was the first probe to go to the asteroid belt and since there was no way to optically find out how many golf ball sized asteroids there were in the belt, Pioneer was the one to do this. Turns out the average distance between an asteroid is about a million kilometers and there's not that much dust and debris floating around in between. So you can really pass through quite effortlessly. Since Pioneer pioneered the way through the asteroid belt, NASA just ignores the asteroid belt as an obstacle on all of its future missions, and all its current missions for that matter. 
since the probability of not successfully navigating an asteroid field is 3,720 to 1. Never tell me the odds. Well, not actually, but it's very unlikely. It just bothers me that movies can't come up with something more exciting. Like, why couldn't they use a nearby supernova or a gamma ray burst or some other crazy space event? Like, a primordial micro black hole. There might be a bunch of those being around the cosmos for all we know. That's the great thing about theoretical physics, is that there's so many awesome and cool and crazy things that you can play on and use on in your films. So why not use any of those numerous different things and put them in the movie? They're realistic, or at least theoretically realistic, and a lot of them are way more exciting than just the same old movie tropes that are always used again and again and again, like the asteroid field. Hollywood screenwriters love to screw over things they deem to interfere with the narrative, like putting on a spacesuit. Spacesuits get taken on and off many times in this movie, and none of those times get it right. I'll give them some credit because they actually have Chris Pratt in a spacesuit, and one that has the accurate pressure of NASA spacesuits written on the heads up display which is a nice little nod to realism and shows that they did a little research. But also doesn't really make sense. NASA spacesuits, these big white things, are pressurized to around 30 kilopascals, which is lower than sea level pressure of 101 kilopascals. What that means is that whenever an astronaut on the ISS wants to get into a spacesuit, they have to spend four hours breathing pure oxygen to remove the nitrogen from the body so that they don't get decompression sickness, commonly known as the bends. The time needed breathing pure oxygen can be reduced if the pressure differential is decreased. For example, the Russians did testing for a higher pressurized suit, and in that case, the cosmonaut only needs to breathe oxygen for a half an hour. That's all very interesting, you might be thinking. But why not just have the suits pressurized to 101 kPa in the first place? If you've ever inflated a surgical glove with air, or in my case, a plastic bag, the more air you breathe into it, and more pressure you create, the stiffer and firmer it gets. The less pressure, the more floppy it gets, the more mobile. That's essentially the same idea with the spacesuit. The more pressure is in the spacesuit, the firmer and harder it is to move the spacesuit. Since space is a vacuum, even a little bit of pressure makes the suit super stiff. And just like the glove, or the bag, the higher the pressure, the stiffer the suit which obviously isn't too great for astronauts and their ability to get work done while doing an EVA. Basically, NASA tries to go as low in pressure as possible whilst maintaining the safety of their astronauts. So back to our star-crossed lovers in the stars, it bothers me that they went through the trouble of putting the NASA suit pressures on the screen, but then ignored the rest of the process. Like it would have made more sense just to claim a suit pressure of 101 kilopascals and say, Future tech equals better suit that works at high pressure. Which would make sense anyways, because on a civilian starship, you would want simple to use spacesuits that don't involve lengthy procedures to get into. Anyway, I digress. This has been a very long analysis on less than a minute of screen time, and I'm clearly overanalyzing, so I'm going to move on. Okay, the bullet corrections section. I have a name for it, bullet corrections. So this is a section where I'm going to go through the movie and look at a bunch of different points and then just point out whether or not they are correct or incorrect. Let's go! Cryopods. Emerging technology with some seriously cool potential, but at the moment, we are unable to reanimate people. We can only put them in stasis. For an awesome article on this topic, check out this link. This elevator scene doesn't really show the gravity right. It would be a very gradual loss of gravity as the elevator is still spinning with the rest of the habitat and I'm assuming it will have to move from one arm to the next, then go down to the other habitat. The elevator will be continuously spinning and never fully lose gravity. What the hell is this door made of? He's a mechanical engineer and he has all of the tools to build the colony at his disposal, but he can't get in? This doesn't seem right. Another gravity faux pas. Since he's at the end of a tether, spinning with the rest of his ship, it's kind of like spinning a ball on a string. His tear would drip off his face onto his screen, and also, to him, it would feel like he's hanging by one point on his back in Earth gravity. 
Maybe even more than Earth gravity, depending on how long that tether is. Or wouldn't exactly be the pleasant, weightless feeling they're showing in the film. Same deal here. The scene wouldn't be quite as romantic, though, if they're both dangling from their butts. Plants? What? Are they being tended to by robots for the entire 120-year journey? If they are, that's a huge waste of energy. Why not just cold store the seeds? That's a tech we actually have today. Check out this video by Veritasium. Plant issues aside, I'm impressed he planted this tree here without her noticing. I get it. This scene looks sick, but totally not real. Noon's first law. It only takes energy to get the ship spinning and to stop spinning. Once it's spinning, it'll just keep spinning. Don't believe me? Just look at the Earth. It's been spinning approximately once every 24 hours for the last four and a half billion years. So if the ship has loss of power, the only thing that would immediately happen is the lights go out. Oh no! Fair enough, floaty ball of water is a cool scene, but still. Again, no. Remember, suits take a while to put on, so this whole sequence is a bust. Why does the fusion reactor core have big windows? That just seems like a terrible idea. Again, messing up the fake gravity. Going realistic would have made the scene more dramatic, not less, so why exclude it? Why is just the handle hot, not the walls, or the floor, or the bolt that gets lodged in her arm? He would be so dead from radiation. I actually like this scene. Shows how helpless we are without gravity. I'm starting to think they just did science for the artificial gravity and then ignored science for the rest. This jump would be so far off target due to the spinning. Little hole like that, if that is the only hole, he'd be fine-ish. At least for the time it takes for her to get to him, the suit would keep trying to re-pressurize and it would probably have enough oxygen to keep him conscious for that time. If you're trying to slow down from 0.5c, why is your main thruster on? And why are you accelerating towards the planet? Yeah, this is just straight up the director wanting a badass scene. The ship is traveling at 0.5 C. At that speed, a gravity assist is useless, and you can't use a star for a gravity assist anyway, so yeah. In an interview, the screenwriter John Spates acknowledged that this scene was more showy than anything else. He actually had a fair understanding of the issues with the maneuver, but he was more focused on the story and the characters than getting the science perfect. Which fine, I can see why he'd want to do that. But I'm still not convinced that you need to sacrifice scientific accuracy for good filmmaking. It doesn't need to be perfect. Things like the displayed suit pressure, I'm nitpicking. But filmmakers really need to try and avoid making huge scientific inaccuracies. Because these inaccuracies skew the public perception of what is actually achievable. This leads to people believing things that aren't true and dismissing things that are. In a way, fake science in film is like fake news in the media. And we all know who likes to use that slogan. Inevitably, it undermines the credibility of science. If you've made it this far, I want to say thank you for watching to the end of the film. I really appreciate all my viewers, all my likes, all my subscribers. Thank you so much for watching. Please like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. I'll try and get as many more out as quickly as I can. When I first watched the film, I thought they actually did a pretty good job with the science. But then, watching it a second time in order to do this review, more and more things just kept coming up and kept coming up and I kept realizing more and more flaws here and there and here and there until by the end I realized that the science is actually way out to lunch and really the only thing they spent a lot of time on was getting the size of the gravity wheel correct. Uh, but after that, there really wasn't much science left in the film. That was pretty much the only thing they had going for them. Uh, but other than that, fantastic film. I really enjoyed watching it and I had a lot of fun making this video. I want to make a quick apology for the lack of focus. There are some mechanical issues with my camera, but I have that all sorted out now. So the next few films shouldn't be as badly focused and they should be in focus properly. If you have any suggestions or ideas for other films that you'd like me to cover, just let me know in the comments and I will probably do them eventually. Thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate your support and I hope to see you again next time on Factor Film. Thank you.